Hello all, Game Methuselah. I hope everyone is doing very well in these, um, well, very interesting times we are living in. For those who follow me on Twitter or have seen me on my YouTube uh, community page, I'm back running my Albion campaign. This time I decided I was going to run it in uh, the new fantasy trip. I really like the game a lot. I decided to run it and I had a whole new group of people that have never played with me. And I thought this would be fun. They were all willing to learn a new system. A lot of people have maybe never played anything but Dungeons and Dragons before. So this was a real departure because the Fantasy Trip is a very, very different game in its mechanics um, in some ways from Dungeons and Dragons. And we started to play. So of course I gave my initial speech about how the war between the fairy folk and the Fomorians had started, how it was Pyrrhic and were nearly destroyed, and the world now belonged to man. It's just the reign of man, and they are coming to fruition here in what amounts to medieval or ancient uh, Britain, made of what was then and to some extent still called Albion. I told them they cannot be elves. Um, they can be other races, but mainly I would prefer that everyone try to be as human as possible because this is what the game is about. Elves are considered the bad guys, um, and we will start the campaign from that point. You have heard about my Albion campaigns. The thing that seems to always happen when you give players parameters is the first thing they want to do is step outside of those parameters and run something different. Of the people who are playing with us now, I have... Two gnomes, one magic user, one sort of alchemist rogue, a dwarf, a goliath, which I had to make up out of whole cloth, but was not difficult because Fantasy Troop is very, very easy to design your own characters in, and a half-elf who, of course, lives in disguise and is not to be an elf. He lives within the human society, and of course, if he's ever found out, very likely he'll be killed, but of course, everyone wants to be different. But throughout my career in role-playing, I have found that when I run, um, or even if I play in a game that has very, very fixed parameters of where the DM wants you to go with characters, everybody wants to push the boundaries to get something very different from what is expected by the DM. Now, it kind of like threw me back a minute, and then I thought, oh, this, this is always this way. And I think it comes to the nature of how people always want to have something that feels unique and different for themselves. And this is a good thing in role-playing. You want people to really push the boundaries and try to come up with something that they're going to enjoy playing. Thusly, they're going to be excited to be in your game. And I was thinking, okay, well, so much for Celtic humans. What are we all having here to run? Now, those of you who have seen my video on how to start a role-playing campaign have seen the village that I'm using. Well, fortuitously for me, I had this Gnomish Adventure Guild, which sort of basically was a waypoint for vagabond gnomes who are lost in the woods after their capital has been destroyed and is now infested with dragons. They have come looking for a new home and have stumbled into the human realms, which were very, very close to Albion. And since they did not really have a lot of direct conflict with humans during the Great Fairy War, um, most of the humans don't know that they're fey folk, or at least semi-fey folk, so they accept them and figure that they're sort of uh, an interesting novelty. If nothing else, they're good traders. They make nice bargains, and they will set out for the adventurers to buy stuff you bring them from your adventures that you may not want. And they were going to offer a fair price. And they have cheap rooms in the back for those low-level adventurers who have not acquired a fortune yet to sort of crash between adventures where they can get a hot meal and a chance to be safe while they heal up and rest up for their next magical encounter. Here's where we were. All right, we're going through the rules, we're designing characters. It always seems much more difficult because when people have played one game system for a very long time, like Dungeons and Dragons, they're trying to stick the concept of how does this play uh, versus Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, what is a Goliath? And what, can I have a bard, or can I have this, or can I have that? And I said, well, really, you design your character from the ground up, and we go through all the things in Fantasy Trek. We started out, um, I thought the best thing to do with new players was to run the standard little dungeon crawl. 
they crawled over to the ancient elven ruin that had been destroyed and many rat catchers were in there now trying to find great wealth that they could bring back and, and improve their lives. And uh, some were doing it and obviously some had disappeared and died and they were finding bodies and things. And they initially got attacked by uh, some Sturgies, which they, they battled off, ran a little farther into the dungeon, ran into some elves um, that were there and, they, and the elves... Um, they hid from, but the gnomes went in there, and since the gnomes had been allies of the elves, the elves were willing to speak with them, and they noticed the elves were shabby and dirty and, and very poor, and their weapons were not of great condition, and they figured these might not be the most savory elves to deal with, so they backed away and went back to the party, and they came through a door and found an ogre, and a battle ensued with this ogre. They were victorious in the battle. They searched around the room, and they thought something was odd, searched a little further, and a secret door that led into this chamber, small chamber where there was a mimic chest. Uh, they attacked the mimic chest and beat on it and beat on it and tore it to pieces and somewhere along the line realized eh, it was already dead. Um, more like they stuck here and not able to get out because of the ogre and no food able to get in. Uh, but it did have treasure in it and amongst the treasure they found was this magic sword. Uh, they acquired uh, a ring that was requested of them by a patron who had given them a map to this location. And all they asked in return was that this one small copper ring, if found, be returned to her uh, because she needed it for something. They did so um, kind of reluctantly, but um, she was willing, of course, to thank them and pay them for the ring um, and pass on good words to the town folk that they were a reliable group of adventurers. So into the first adventure, they had a magic sword, and it was pretty nice. Plus two fine, plus one magical damage, and plus three magical damage against humans. Well, that didn't necessarily think it was going to go over well in a human realm, so they didn't know what to do with it, so they were keeping it. Since they were gnomes and dwarves, uh, one archer human... Um, and a Goliath, well, nobody used swords, uh, and the only person who did was the archer, and he wasn't strong enough to carry it. So they thought, well, we'll just keep it, and maybe we'll switch weapons, or we'll do something else. But what I thought would be very interesting to do is to take this in a different place. The gnomes themselves offered to buy it, which they, of course, didn't want to want to do initially. But they said, well, we might have a proposition for you, and we'll talk about it after the next adventure. They all went to sleep. The next morning, the town guard is there amongst the gnomes, looking to call them out in a very brash manner, saying that they all have to come before the druids and be interrogated for the kidnapping of small children and little girls. And they were like, what, 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 what? We didn't do anything. And they called them out and they said, there are many of mothers and grandmothers who said that it was the gnomes who carried off these children in the middle of the night. We knew because of their size and stature and the little hoods they wore that they were gnomes and we cannot have this vagrant mob of horribles living amongst us. The gnomes are thinking, well, okay, well, it's not us, it's somebody else. And they're saying, well, you'll have to be called before the druids to be interrogated. And they're thinking, uh-oh. Being gnomes and having to live under the tender mercies of these humans, especially religious fanatics, this might not go well for us. So maybe it's incumbent upon us to find out who did kidnap these children and maybe rescue them or at least get the news back to them so that they can find out it was not us. So that's what they decided to do. Sneak off in the middle of the night before they could be interrogated, follow the path off into the elven world, and rescue the children. They found the path fortuitously. They were able to follow it with some difficulty and found an old ruined fortification. They went inside, found it was kind of rough hewn, and they stumbled upon and battled with a bunch of goblins. Uh, the battle ensues for quite a while. Uh, it's interesting, and the party puts up a fight. Uh, there were some small battles with some scorpions and some other things, but they're able to beat and capture some of the goblins. One goblin says, look, 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 if you let me go, I will take you to what prisoners are still alive that we have not fed to the dragon, and you can rescue them and take them back. Just, just spare my life. And they're like, okay, show us the kids. And, and they do, and they're able to rescue three kids, and as they're leaving, one of them wants to go back 
because he wants to see if he can see the spot out this dragon. So the, the stealthy rogue goes back in, finds the dragon who says, I smell you there, gnome. I know you're here. I can't see you, but I will find you. And the dragon looks for him and breathes fire and the gnome runs and they all go, yep, there really is a dragon. He's not very big. Well, he's pretty big, but not big as, well, big dragons go. That's the second adventure. They've now rescued the children, who of course confirm that it was not them, but the evil goblins. They have the goblins in tow, which they willingly give up to the Celtic elders and the druids for, well, their tender mercies, which basically meant, well, there are no more goblins. The third adventure was the one I just did, and for those of you who saw it, they went down to encounter the dragon and finish him off and get his treasure hoard. And that's what's gone on, all based upon my initial map of what clues you have for starting a campaign. And it's worked out well. And I am now going to have them look at it again to sort of figure out where we're going to go from this point on. But the also thing was, is that they now have struck a bargain, giving the gnomes the magic sword that they acquired in the first adventure, and the gnomes will put up some cash, and they're going to expand their gnomish location as partners. That was something I kind of thought of, and I thought it would be very interesting to kind of give them some grounding within the world. Of course, the main goal for the gnomes is to go back and slay the dragons and recover their capital and allow the gnomish people to come back to their own realm, since most of them now are spread throughout the world. But in the meantime, we can build our gnomish community here, and we can provide blacksmithing services, we can provide alchemy services, with one of the characters being an alchemist. We could even do a small wizard school for all the gnomish wizards to improve their skills and build up their, their items. And that's going to be what's going to happen. They're going to have basically an armor maker who's going to be able to make fine weapons and have them enchanted by the wizards with magical abilities and let the players sort of design and build their own magical items. And I thought that would be very fun and very interesting instead of just sort of finding the magical items and making do with them. Now that, of course, will be part and parcel of it, like it always is. But since the fantasy trip had a very vibrant uh, system for making magical items, which we had really never used much through the many decades we used the system, I thought it would be very fun to do that this time. And we'll see how it works out. Where they are the gnomes amongst the human society lends an interesting touch because, of course, you have that rub of bigotry and all the things that go on when you have different societies clashing together. And we're going to see how this is going to play, but I'm very, very optimistic. The players seem very happy with the game, and I'm very happy with the players. I have not played with any of them before, except for Steve, who I ran over at Barnes & Noble a couple times while he DM'd. Um, but I, it's nice to have fresh blood in the game, and they're, and they're bringing some very interesting things to the game that I did not expect. Um, they're very seasoned role players, so you get a lot of fun things going on. In the battle with the dragon, the little gnome stealth guy, who really was not much of a fighter, leaped into the hand-to-hand -hand with the dragon and, and taunted him and, and was sort of trying to gather his attention away so his friends could get advantage in attacks against him. Now, this is where season DMing helps, and as I've talked to you about the concept of don't stay within the framework of rules. In a hand-to-hand, -hand, which doesn't really exist much in Dungeons & Dragons, hand-to-hand -hand in the fantasy trip is when you actually enter the space of your enemy. He has to drop any weapon that is larger than a dagger. Hopefully, if he can, draw a dagger. Maybe he can push you back. But if he does not push you back, if you're able to get in hand-to-hand, -hand, you then basically are rolling around the ground meleeing, fist fighting, stabbing with daggers. It's an interesting way uh, to basically unarm a truly awesome opponent who you have the ability to be able to go into hand-to-hand. -hand. In this game system, I've actually built characters who are made for hand-to-hand. For -hand. But in the system that exists, once you're in a hand-to-hand, -hand, there are things that change. It's easier to hit the person in hand-to-hand. -hand. Uh, you do damage based upon strength, not upon your weapon. And I looked at this situation. And normally you have two options. Well, maybe three options. You can attack. You can defend. You can attempt to disengage from the hand-to-hand, -hand, which is not automatic once you're in hand-to-hand. -hand. The problem was he's in hand-to-hand -hand with a dragon. Now, admittedly not the largest dragon in the world, but a dragon that takes up four spaces on a battle map more likely weighs as much as a car uh, is more than likely going to slaughter a very small gnome at very low level uh, rogue. So I gave him 
the options. You may attack, you may defend, you may attempt to disengage. And then I made one up. Or you may attempt to use your enhanced good dexterity to stay on his back. You can make no attack. All you can do is try to hold on, but he will not be able to attack you. You will not be able to attack him, but you can continue to taunt him. And if you do this, of course, you know, he can't eat you. Now, he thought this was a good idea, and that's what he did. And we played this. It was really great. He made the dragon disadvantaged against the opponents that were outside who were attacking in on the dragon because he's trying to wriggle around to get to a point where he can eat this gnome. In the meantime, he'll make some attacks against the other players as he can, but I can't cast any spells. He can't do any of the things he's capable of doing. So it was really, really very advantageous for the party. And it doesn't get the gnome killed instantaneously because pretty much one bite from this dragon or even one claw was likely just to kill this character outright. Um, and they didn't have a lot of healing. It was not likely they were going to be able to get him back to zero uh, before the time came up and whoops, he died. So it was a fun way to obviously, as I've talked about before, not let the rules constrain um, your gameplay. Now, a lot of people who would not be seasoned would not have done this. The gnome would have been dead. You know, a great moment in the campaign, a great moment in the history of this character would have been lost. He's a very cool and interesting character. Um, if he wanted to choose to fight, okay, you know, at that point, it's Katie bar the door. It's all up to you. You have cast the die. The outcome is in your hands. So I would have no compunction in killing him at that point. But it sets the stage for future things. Now, we also have introduced new characters. As I said before, somebody came in and I explained to him and he said, no, no, I, I want to be uh, an elf or at least a half elf or something. That, And I'm like, nah, you know, if they find out who you are, they're just going to kill you. I mean, it's not going to work. And he was just, I really want to do it. And I said, okay, well, we'll come up with a backstory. You have to think about it and work about it. You basically are raised in the woods by someone who you call mother, but you don't think she actually is. She might not even be human or elf. My thinking was maybe it was a dryad or something. Somebody that took the child, that found the child lost in the woods and raised it as her own. But he might come up with something different, in which case we'll see how that works. And the idea is, been raised as a human, speaks human tongue, because of the half-blood, pretty much looks like a human, as long as you maybe don't look too closely. So we will see how this goes. Uh, I, he's willing to accept the risk, so it will be fun. But of course, it adds again to the storyline. So now we have the adventures. After three adventures, they have acquired two levels or two points of advancement. There is no real levels in the fantasy trip. All it is is levelless role-playing, but the characters get better at what they do. And I find that this is very satisfactory, and I'm hoping the players will feel so also, and I think they do. Um, they've also had a feeling that the adventures have been very perilous, um, and they sort of have, but, but in a very minor way. I think that in most cases, I did not anticipate any major calamities sans a major critical that just, well, you know, outright kills a character, and... But it's been fun. And now we're continuing on. So we'll be able to try to show Mambos based upon what these characters do and what the other people who have sent me characters are involved in. I'll try to include them, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to find some way of getting some more interaction between players of my game and people who are watching the videos uh, being able to kind of get involved with the, with the interaction. I hope you'll like it, but the idea, of course, is twofold. When you have characters that want to diverge, let them diverge. I mean... I think that myself, through all my careers in running, and I've always loved, well, the tragic hero. It's always been the one character I enjoy the most. Um, or the down-and-out Ronin Samurai, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the Kurosawa Seven Samurai movie. And if you are not, you must watch it. It is a fabulous movie filled with interesting Dungeons & Dragons characters. But there's an old man, uh, I think his name is Kembi, and he's an old Ronin samurai, has nothing, walking the roads. When the peasants come to him and say that this evil man has taken these children, he's going to kill them 
if they can't, if they don't give him something and they don't have it and, you know, it's going like that. So he shaves his top knot and dons the garb of a monk to go in and negotiate the, the exchange of the children for what this man wants and, of course, kills him, saves the kids. Now, there might be some additional reasons that I feel some great fondness for him. But, you know, Yojimbo or any of those Ronin-type characters are very interesting. Plus, you know, there are so many other down-and-out heroes, and those are the ones I always love to play. Troll Slayers from Warhammer Fantasy, I always thought were fabulous. The idea that they lost their honor, and that's what they were going to try to do, is die gallantly to regain the family honor. Things like that really excite me. So, I have the same desire as everyone else to run something that I feel is unique to me. So never restrict, if you can avoid it, what players want to do with their imagination. Let them be as, as wild as you possibly can and find ways of writing them in. After three adventures, quite frankly, I think these gnomes now excite me more than if they had run Celtic characters because now they're building um, a little bit in the, their society and this other society and that'll set up for a whole lot of side adventures that I'll be able to run off the fact that, well, because they're gnomes, they have to do this or that or people will come in and you can see where this goes. But I think it's fun to keep your mind open and hopefully we'll get more and more good live role playing going on and get out there and enjoy yourself. So however you're enjoying your hobby right now, and if it's online, great, no matter what, but get out there and game as much as you possibly can for, as you guys all know, fight me devils fight. I hate peace. Game on.